hi everyone and welcome to the third session of this third edition of Corpus Curiosum. Uh, we are very happy to be here today. And as you maybe all know by now, uh, well, we uh, take this name of Corpus Curiosum as a kind of fun because of the Corpus Curiosum, right? And the metaphor in here is that we are trying to say that a corpus curiosum is supposed to be a, like in the same way that the corpus curiosum is linking the whole brain and keeping it, keeping the two hemispheres together, right? Uh, what we are trying to do in here is create a space that makes all the different uh, fields of neuroscience together, which is critical thinking, right? And that's uh, basically our initiative, and that's us, uh, Alba, Faisal, and Ines. We are all based in different uh, institutions and in different countries at the moment, and we are at different stages in our uh, research careers, like I'm a postdoc, postdoc, and I'm a PhD student, and Faisal is a, a master's student. And well, we wanted also to say that in this edition, we are actually not alone because it hasn't been only us, but we had these uh, wonderful ambassadors that were helping us to disseminate the, the agenda and to tell uh, everyone about this uh, third edition. So we wanted to say a big thank you to all of them because uh, uh, this third edition is also possible thanks to them. And we wanted, of course, to also mention our uh, sponsors of this third edition. We are very happy that the IBO, uh, we actually were award, awarded with the IBO diversity grant because we are always trying to uh, make our uh, editions as diverse as possible regarding like speakers and regarding also uh, the audience. And that's why, uh, yeah, I wrote thought that we deserve this. So we are incredibly happy about that. And also we have uh, the support of the fans and the support of the assets. Uh, and this society is actually the Society of Scientists of Spanish Societies in the Confederación Helvetica. If you want to know more information about them, we have in here a QR, so check it out. And this is you guys. So um, for this uh, third edition, we have people coming from 47 different countries, which is amazing, and coming from actually more than 100 institutions. So um, this is actually very cool because right now we are like everywhere in the world. Uh, that's kind of the magic of the internet, right? And well, three important notes before we start. First of all, as we all know already, recording, we are recording the sessions, but the session, but it's going to be only recorded like the, this intro and the talk. So that means that the discussion won't be recorded. So, and your image won't ever be like on the internet. So don't worry about that. Then the Q&A, uh, feel free to write in the chat, whatever question you might have. We'll be asking the question to uh, speaker of today. And then if you guys want to add something to the answer, of course, you're free to do it. And then um, about the length, as you guys know, we are aiming to do like 30 minutes of talk, 30 minutes of questions. But of course, we are a bit flexible and you guys are free to leave earlier, of course. And uh, without more delay, here's today's speaker, Professor Peter Hacker. We are incredibly happy that he accepted our invitation because it's going to be a great uh, thing to uh, critically reflect on, right? So Professor Peter Hacker is an Emeritus Fellow and former Tutorial Fellow in Philosophy at St. John's College in Oxford. And well, his uh, CV is uh, amazing, basically. Um, and well, he's the author of 24 books, editor of four books, and author of 165 papers. And together with um, Bennett, Max Bennett, he has written extensively on cognitive neuroscience, and it's actually very interesting, this book, and suitable for the meeting of today, the topic of uh, the book of Philosophical Foundation of Neuroscience, which is a good recommendation for everyone. And this is the topic that we are going to be addressing today. So um, does your brain actually think the neurological fallacy in neuroscience? Peter, now the room is all yours. Oh. He's going to be offered, like, giving a lecture, so no PowerPoint, in case someone gets uh... an honor for me to be able to address so many uh, uh, young neuroscientists um, on the topic of uh, what I and uh, Max Bennett call the meriological fallacy in neuroscience. 
Uh, Max Bennett and I wrote a book, uh, The Philosophical Foundations of Neuroscience in 2003. And a leitmotif running through the book is the idea of a meriological mistake or a meriological fallacy. Uh, it's only a leitmotif, it's not the main theme of the book, but it runs through the book because the meriological fallacy is ubiquitous in neuroscience, uh, as I shall show you in a moment. Now, first of all, let me try to clarify for you what precisely meriology means. The technical term meriology was co coined only in 1927 by the Polish logician Leżniewski. The name is derived from the Greek word mere, meaning a part, and meriology is the study of the logic of part-whole relationships. I can try to give you some idea of the nature of this rather small domain of logic uh, by uh, spelling out three axioms of some meriological systems. For example, a part of a part of a whole is itself a part of a whole. So my finger is part of my hand and my hand is part of my body, so my finger is part of my body. So the relationship is transitive, as logicians would say. Second axiom is two distinct entities cannot each be part of the other. Uh, I mean, if A is part of B, then B can't also be part of A. So it is what logicians call antisymmetric. And the third axiom is that nothing is part of itself. So the relationship is irreflexive. Now, that, that's really all you need to know about the science of uh, the, the logic of Mariology. I just want to utilize the logic with respect to one kind of meriological mistake or fallacy. And that is the uh, fallacy or mistake of ascribing to a part of a whole attributes that it makes sense to ascribe only to the whole of which the part is a part. I'll say that again. It is the fallacy of ascribing to a part of a whole attributes that it makes sense to ascribe only to the whole of which the part is a part. Uh, now, you've noticed that I've equivocated between saying it's a mistake and it's a fallacy. Uh, strictly speaking, it's just a mistake. A, a fallacy is a fault in reasoning. It's invalid reasoning. And the meriological mistake leads to fallacies in neuroscience, in, in reasoning. Uh, so I don't mind whether we call it mistake or fallacy as long as it's clear. Now, the mistake I have in mind is not peculiar to the biological sciences or to the brain sciences. It's obvious that one can't infer from the fact that an aeroplane flies that his engines fly. And it doesn't follow from the fact that an antique table clock tells the time that its fusée or great wheel tells the time. And obviously, that, those would be two mistakes. On the other hand, there are cases where you can infer from a whole to its parts. From the fact that a knife cuts well, it does follow that its blade cuts well, and the blade is part of the knife. From the fact that a statue is made of bronze, it follows that the parts of the statue are all made of bronze. So the first question we have to ask is, well, what differentiates the licit cases from the illicit cases? Well, it obviously turns on the criteria that have to be satisfied for the ascription to be true, or even just to make sense. After all, aeroplane engines by themselves don't rev up and take off. Uh, um, and uh, no, that's something the aeroplane as a whole does. Of course, it couldn't do it but for the engines, but the engines don't fly. And similarly, we know what it is for a clock to tell the time, but there's no such thing as a fusée telling the time. You can't look at the fusée and tell, decide tell what time it is. Now, of course, no one's tempted to make those mistakes in respect of machinery. They make different mistakes with respect to machinery. The most obvious one being is they ascribe cognitive predicates to computers, but that's another long story which I won't enter in now, into now. Now, there is one large range of attributes and corresponding range of predicates, the predicate being the expre linguistic expression that signifies the attribute, so one large range that signify attributes that we're very, very strongly inclined to misascribe or mistakenly predicate of the wrong kind of subjects. 
I'll give you some striking examples of extremely distinguished scientists, neuroscientists, often Nobel Prize winning laureates, who ascribe to the brain, which is part of a human being, such attributes that, as I shall show you, can only intelligibly be ascribed to a human being as a whole. So let me take first Francis Crick, a Nobel Prize winner. And he wrote, and I quote, what you see is not what is really there, it's what your brain believes is there. Your brain makes the best interpretation it can according to its previous experience and the limited and ambiguous information provided by your eyes. The brain combines the information provided by the many distinct features of the visual scene and settles on the most plausible interpretation. Gerald Edelman, another Nobel laureate, holds that structures within the brain categorize, discriminate, and recombine the various brain activities occurring in different kinds of global mappings. And the brain recursively relates semantic to phonological sequences and then generates syntactic correspondences. Antonio Damasio, another distinguished neuroscientist, claimed that our brains can often decide well in seconds or minutes, depending on the time frame we set as appropriate for the goal we want to achieve. Colin Blakemore, a distinguished British neuroscientist, argues that uh, he's talking about the, uh, uh, the columns in V1 of the visual stride cortex. We seem driven to say that such neurons, as the neurons in V1, such neurons uh, have knowledge. They have intelligence, for they're able to estimate the probability of outside events, events that are important to the animal in question. And the brain gains its knowledge by a process analogous to the inductive reasoning of the classical scientific method. Neurons present arguments to the brain based on the specific features that they detect, again, arguments on which the brain constructs its hypothesis of perception. Okay, so the brain knows things, believes things, interprets, combines information, decides things, reasons inductively, constructs hypotheses, and neurons are intelligent, can estimate probability and present arguments to the brain. The same curious maneuver is made by psychologists and cognitive scientists too. In, and in fact, as you must know, uh, it, this is the received form of description adopted by virtually all cognitive neuroscientists and virtually demanded by neuroscientific journals. It seems to me very striking that this form of description should be rampant and should go unchallenged. Now, there is an explanation for this, which I shall offer you in due course. But first, let me draw your attention to just what a bizarre mode of description it is. I want to raise uh, some doubts or some suspicions in you. With such broad consensus on the correct way to think about the functions of the brain, one's prone to be swept along by enthusiastic announcements of new fields of knowledge conquered, new mysteries unveiled. But we really should take things slowly and pause for thought. We know what it is for human beings to experience things, to see things, to make decisions, to know and believe things, to interpret equivocal data, to guess and to form hypotheses. We use these expressions in our everyday discourse. We know what they mean. We know when to use them. We will know when they're mistakenly used. We understand what it is for people to reason inductively, to estimate probabilities, to present arguments, to classify things they encounter. We pose questions and search for answers using a symbolism, namely our language, in terms of which we represent things. But do we know what it is for a brain to see or hear? For a brain to have experiences? Or for a brain to know or believe something? Do we have any conception of what it would be for a brain to make a decision? Do we grasp what it is for a brain, let alone a neuron, to reason from a set of premises to a conclusion, no matter whether inductively or deductively, or to estimate possibilities to present arguments and so forth. We can observe whether a human being, a person sees something or other, 
we look at his behavior and we ask him questions. But what would it be to observe whether a brain sees something as opposed to observing the brain of a human being when the human being sees something? We recognize when someone asks a question and when someone else answers it. But do we have any conception of what it would be for a brain to ask a question to answer one? These are all attributes of human beings. No, the neuroscientist says they're attributes of brains. Now, is that a new discovery? Unknown to all thinkers prior to the late 20th century, that brains also engage in act such activities. Not only do we engage in them, but our brains do too. Well, that's one possibility. Uh, hitherto, prior to the 20th, mid, late 20th century, hitherto unknown. Another possibility is this is a linguistic innovation introduced by neuroscientists, psychologists, and cognitive scientists, extending the ordinary use of these psychological expressions for good theoretical reasons. That is also a possibility. Or more ominously, as I shall argue and try to show you, is it a conceptual confusion? Might it be the case that there's simply no such thing as the brain's thinking or knowing, seeing or hearing, believing or guessing, possessing and using information, constructing hypotheses and so forth. That is that these, were, these forms of words make no sense. They are, strictly speaking, nonsense, not rubbish, but they make no sense. They are forms of words which, if you like, transgress the limits of what can be said in the language intelligibly. Well, so we have three options. It's a discovery, it's a linguistic innovation and extension, or it's a confusion. Well, suppose there is indeed no such thing, as I would argue, and some, there's something very, very puzzling here. Why have so many distinguished scientists and Nobel Prize winners thought that these phrases thus employed do make sense? Well, it, there's a story to be told here, and I'll try to summarize it for you. We have to go back to the 17th century. In the dualist tradition of early modern philosophy, Cartesian and empiricist, uh, it was common to ascribe all predicates associated with consciousness to the mind. After all, the only alternative, it seemed to thinkers of the day, is to ascribe them to the, to the body. But no one wished to say, that their body thinks. My body surely doesn't think or perceive. My body doesn't know or believe things, hope or fear, and so on. So it must be my mind. That's generally speaking the received view uh, right down to the 20th century. Let me turn to neuroscience, in particular to Sherrington, whom I take it is more or less akin to the Newton of modern neuroscience, although on the whole, did not engage greatly in cognitive neuroscience. Sherrington was an avowed dualist, and his Gifford lectures, highly praised by the great physicist uh, Owen Schrodinger, uh, defended a dualist view of the relationship between the mind and the brain. His great pupils, Eccles, a Nobel Prize winner, and uh, the great uh, uh, surgeon, Penfield, followed in his wake. In fact, it wasn't until the third generation of 20th century neuroscientists that dualism was actually abandoned. Neuroscientists from the 1970s onwards were rightly loath to commit themselves to the existence of an immaterial mind mysteriously associated with and in causal interaction with the human body. And this was quite right. However, they retained the dualist conception of the body. And rather than ascribing such attributes to the body or in particular to their body and saying it's their body that thinks, their body that reasons, their body that hypothesized, they simply identified the mind with the brain or parts of the brain and ascribed all psychical predicates to the brain. Just by the way, I'd use the term P predicate and P attribute for brevity's sake I don't use the term psychological because it's too, it's too slippery. So I'd use the term psychical 
uh, to cover all the kinds of predicates that they have in mind. Um, so uh, rather than ascribing such attributes to, to, to the body or their body, they identify the mind with the brain. The mind just is the brain or part of the brain and described all P predicates to the brain. What is interesting that in doing this, they retained the logical structure of dualist and empiricist conceptions of the mental and of the causal explanation of behavior. All they did was to show a preference for gray glutinous matter over ethereal non-matter. And consequently, they perpetuated all the traditional logical confusions of early modern philosophy. Let me give you an important example. The great scientist von Helmholtz, who did great work on the theory of vision and on endless other things, wrote in one of his books on uh, the uh, uh, neuroscience of vision, he wrote that the conceptual framework for all his work in this domain was derived from John Locke. And that's very striking. Okay, now why, why? Well, one root of the confusion is already implicit in something I've said, but you didn't notice it. That is, they didn't distinguish the body one has from the body one is. That sounds very obscure. Let me, it isn't actually, but let me explain it. The body one is, is the living human being one is. You know, who's Peter, 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 what's Peter Hacker? I'm Peter Hacker, this living animal sitting before you and talking. That's me, Peter Hacker, not something else ethereal, right? Uh, now, it's a body in the sense that it's a spatio-temporal continuum consisting of matter that traces a spatio-temporal path through the world. It's not an inanimate body like my desk, which is in front of me. It's an animate body. And it's not merely an animate body. It's an animate body that is sentient and self-moving, has linguistic capacities and capacity for thought and will. But it's still a physical body in the physical world. That's the body I am. Okay, now what about the body I have? Well, the body one has is the sum of one's somatic characteristics. All talk of my body is no more than a way of speaking of one's bodily characteristics. My body may be painted blue like the ancient Britons, or it may be covered with scratches or mosquito bites if I've been walking through uh, uh, brambles. My body may be sunburnt all over or crippled with arthritis. My body may be weak with age and feeble. But obviously my body can't be said to think or believe, to hope or to fear, to go to school or to university, to earn a living or to be impoverished, to buy or sell, to get married and have children. These are attributes of human beings, not of their bodies. And of course, my body doesn't have a mind because to have a mind is not a somatic characteristic. Now, it immediately follows that everything true of my body is true of me, because all talk of my body is true of my somatic characteristics. But not everything true of me is true of my body, because the whole host of P predicates, P attributes, of thinking, reasoning, seeing, feeling, getting married, et cetera, et cetera. All this is true of me, but it's not true of my body because these are not somatic characteristics. Now, if one fails to distinguish the body one is from the body one has, then it will seem obvious <coughs> the body one has, my body, does not think or reason, perceive or want things. So it must be the brain, but that's mistaken. It can be the body I am, this living, sentient, self-moving, self-conscious animal. It's the human being that I am that thinks and reasons, feels pain and perceives. Okay, that's an important first step, a uh, second step. Why then is it a meriological mistake or fallacy 
to ascribe pre-predicates to the brain. Now, clearly, the grounds for ascribing such predicates, the constitutive grounds, are not satisfied by the brain. The grounds for saying that someone is in pain is that he's injured himself badly, is bleeding, is screaming his head off and writhing in pain. The grounds for saying of someone that they see something is that he's looking at it and responding intelligently to it. He doesn't bump into it or trip over it if he's walking across the room, but he steps over it or walks around it. That he can give a correct answer to the question of what he sees and of whether he sees the third side. These are grounds for saying of someone uh, that he sees something. The grounds for saying of someone that is frightened of something is that he turns pale, trembles, his voice quavers, and he says that he's afraid, that he tries to avoid what frightens him or grits his teeth and faces up to it courageously. Now, brains do not respond in this way to the human being's bodily injuries or to environmental stimuli. Brains don't turn their eyes to what is in view and don't follow what is in view with their eyes, since brains don't have eyes. Brains don't manifest desires by trying to reach out for what they want, for brains have no hands or arms with which to reach anything. Brains don't tremble with fear, turn white or flee from danger. Now, not only do brains not manifest P attributes, there is no such thing as a brain behaving in this way. All a brain can do is metabolize, pass minute electrical currents across neural circuitry, change electrical potentials of neurons, and so on and so forth. It's no more intelligible to speak of the brain thinking, hypothesizing, reasoning, hoping, and fearing than it is to speak of trees talking, stones listening, sticks thinking, and roses being in pain. So it's not merely false that P attributes can be attributed to the brain or to parts of the brain, it actually makes no sense. So to look for the parts of the brain that reasons and thinks, draws inferences and constructs hypotheses, is not like looking for the source of the river Nile, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, once unknown, but was discovered by Burton and Speak, the great explorers. It's not like looking for El Dorado either. The conquistadores looked for El Dorado, but they didn't find it because it didn't actually exist, although it might have existed. But the quest for the uh, uh, brain's thinking and the locus of the brain's thought is not like that either. It's rather like Winnie the Pooh. I hope you've read Winnie the Pooh. It's rather like Winnie the Pooh who set out to look for the East Pole. But there's no such thing as an East Pole. A fortiori, there's no such thing as finding the East Pole, and we wouldn't even know what it was to find the East Pole. There is no such thing. So what I suggest to you is that the biological fallacy in neuroscience is conceptual, not empirical. And it's shown to be a mistake or fallacy by conceptual investigations, not by experiments. And that is why cognitive neuroscience stands in need of philosophy. Now, I, I want to make one important point here. I'm not arguing for my profession as opposed to your profession. It doesn't matter who does the philosophical analysis. It can be neuroscientists. Or when Einstein did his great work on the theory of relativity, the large part of the, of the antecedent thinking is purely philosophical. It's reflection on what can possibly be meant by simultaneity when you're talking about cosmic distances. And after that comes the empirical part. So Einstein did the conceptual analysis and then he went on and did the science. I'm talking about two distinct intellectual activities, not two different people, kinds of people. It's cognitive science, not philosophy, that extends our knowledge of the brain and its functions. Philosophy is not in possession of any information that the neuroscientist lacks. What philosophy offers is not knowledge, but understanding, and in particular, an understanding of the conceptual and logical structures of the language 
in which knowledge and neuroscientific knowledge finds its expression. Now, of course, you're just as much masters of the English language or of your own native tongue as, as I am. I have no special privileges where we both speak our language, our native languages equally well. But to be able to speak your native language to perfection does not mean you have an overview of the structure and nature of that language. Let me give you a little example to perhaps titillate your imagination. Everybody knows the difference between the word nearly and the word almost. We all use these languages, these words very frequently. What's the difference between nearly and almost? Now, I've, I've asked thousands of people over the last 30 years or so what the difference between these two words is, and not once did I find an answer. And the answer is, they behave differently under negation. You can say there isn't nearly enough sugar in the pudding. You can't say there isn't almost enough sugar in the pudding. Of course, I should have thought of that. Yes, you should have thought of that, but you didn't. Because to master the use of language does not mean mastering its comparative use or mastering the overview of its use. Nobody would ever say there's not almost enough sugar in that pudding. No one. And immediately I tell you what the difference is, you immediately say, yes, of course. But I've never come across anyone who thought of the difference. Uh, I was not the original thinker here. My dear late friend B. Rundle thought of this, but I think it's a brilliant example, precisely because it's of no philosophical significance, but it illuminates how you can master a language, but must not master its, not have an overview of the language. Okay. Now let me come back to the meriological fallacy. Why does it matter? I mean, okay, you might say, well, Peter Heck has come up with these uh, funny ideas, or oh, just semantics. What, what, why, why does it matter? Well, if I'm right in suggesting to you that it doesn't make sense, then it matters because what doesn't make sense cannot be either true or false. A condition for anything to, to be true or false is it has to make sense. I mean, the sentence, uh, uh, he put an event in a hole and it turned green, makes no sense at all. You can't say it's false. It's not false. It doesn't mean anything. There's nothing that would count as an event going into a hole and turning green. So it's sheer nonsense. Now, science is a pursuit of truth and neuroscience is certainly a pursuit of truth. So the Hypotheses, the assertions, the statements should make sense. Further, from hypotheses that make no sense, intelligible results can only emerge by accident. Now that has happened, but it's not a method that recommends itself. In that respect, it would be rather like the rom late romantic and corrupt view that you can only achieve virtue through sin. Well, we should achieve virtue, but that's not a method or a way that recommends itself. Um, once you know that these forms of description make no sense, you can avoid using them easily. A third uh, consideration is that if a question makes no sense, it's very unlikely that its answer will make any sense. For strictly speaking, there can be no answer. So for example, Eric Kandel, who got a Nobel Prize for his work on memory, uh, was pursuing the question, where does the brain store its memories? But brains don't have memories, human beings have memories. Moreover, to store a memory means to write it down on a piece of paper or to write it down on a card index or to write it down in a notebook, uh, uh, to type it into your computer. You can store what you remember on a computer. Uh, and if in cases of visual scenes, you can take a photograph. You can store a lot of your mem well, memories in photos, which we all do. You can't store memories in brains. What happens in the brain is what makes it possible for you to have memories to remember things, to be able to say whatever it is that you learned, because to remember is to come to know something and not to forget it. 
Uh, interestingly enough, in the case of Kandel, all his work was on aplysia, a sea slug, which is such a primitive creature that the question of its knowing anything, learning anything, and coming to know things doesn't even arise. What Kandel was actually doing research on uh, was uh, simply reflex actions. And he discovered that in order to, for there to be the kinds of reflex actions that applies to displays, uh, uh, there has to be change at, at, uh, at uh, um, uh, neural connections and synapses. Okay. Now, the results of neuroscientific research are also likely to be misunderstood by the neuroscientists themselves. They may believe that their research show which parts of the brain thinks and reasons, but no parts of the brain think and reasons. They may believe that the brain remembers what it's learned, but brains don't learn things. And since memory is knowledge retained, as I've just suggested, brains don't remember. They make it possible for us to remember. Further reason, what looks like an explanation may be no more than dressing up a question in the guise of an answer. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Sperry and Gazaniga. Uh, and they investigated patients who had been subjected horribly to uh, uh, um, commissurotomy. This was done in the 1950s uh, to alleviate the, the symptoms of really acute uh, chronic uh, um, epilepsy. And it alleviated the epileptic symptoms. It had other pretty dreadful side effects too. Now, there's some very, very curious phenomena uh, consequent upon uh, um, uh, commissurotomy. I won't go into it in detail, but the, uh, the, the phenomena involve um, confabulation rather in the way that people in post-hypnotic suggestion confabulate. If you tell them, well, if you tell them under hypnosis at three o'clock, pick up the ashtray, and they pick up the ashtray, and then you ask them, well, why did you pick up the ashtray? They'll confabulate. They'll tell you a story which you know is false. Now, in the case of commissurotomy, you get a similar phenomenon of confabulation. And Sperry and Gazanica explained it by reference to the idea that one hemisphere can see but can't know anything, and the other hemisphere can know something but can't see anything. And as a result of the commissurotomy, the first hemisphere can't transmit what it sees, can't transmit the information it possesses to the second hemisphere. And so you get this bizarre uh, behavior. But Hemispheres don't see, and hemispheres don't know anything, and hemispheres can't transmit information in the relevant sense in which you and I possess information, in the sense in which knowledge is possession of information. Hemispheres can't transmit information. What they can transmit is neuroimpulses. Now, in fact, to say that it's explained by reference to this fairy tale is just to dress up the question in the form of an answer. Because yes, of course we know that the one hemisphere is active in uh, uh, enabling a person to see, and the other hemisphere is active in enabling a person to say what he sees. And when you cut the corpus callosum, a person behaves in odd ways. But that's dressing it up in the fairy tale dressing of the one hemisphere knowing the other hemisphere seeing and, one, and not being able to talk to each other adds nothing but redundant decoration that is deep, deeply misleading. So it looks like an explanation, but isn't one. Some research can be dismissed as simply incoherent. And I suggest to you, and I, I can't tell you, uh, explain to you why here, Benjamin Libet and his followers for the last 40 years have done work on voluntary action asking a question, namely, how can the brain decide between alternatives, or how long before one moves one's finger does the brain inform one that it has decided to move? Well, the questions make no sense, and all the research, I put it to you, is worthless, because the, 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 there's nothing, there's no question to answer. And finally, demands are placed upon the brain, explanatory demands, uh, that can be satisfied only at the human level of explanation. For example, with respect to the conception of self-consciousness. Now, to be a, there are many different senses of self-conscious, but the one that's interesting is 
uh, uh, the ability to reflect upon one's own motives and attitudes, a, a, a capacity which was possessed par excellence by Marcel Proust. We all have it, but not all of us engage in it too much. It's, a, it's slightly painful, and secondly, it's an invitation to self-deception. Now, you can explain that in terms of human beings possessing a language, and if you have a, a language in which you can articulate your reasons for doing something, and articulate your attitudes and your likings and dislikings, then you can ask the question, well, why do I like it or dislike it? Why did I do what, I, and so forth? And that explains the ability to be self-conscious. Neuroscientists took it that what it needs is a, a neural self-scanning device. Well, it's not as if we're all clear what a neural self-scanning device means. There may be loops which return on themselves. That's fine. But even if there were a neural self-scanning device, it would contribute nothing to explaining what self-consciousness is or what it means or what abilities it presupposes. All the neuroscientific neuro investigation would explain how it is that we possess this ability. And to do that, it has to explain how it is that we're masters of language. So those, that's quite a long array of reasons why it matters. It's not trivial. It's not just semantics. Now to conclude, it may amuse you to know, and slightly shock you perhaps, that this mistake was first pointed out 2,300 years ago. Aristotle, undoubtedly, I think, the most intelligent man who ever lived, certainly the greatest philosopher who ever lived. Aristotle wrote, and he's talking about the psuche. To say that the psuche is angry is as if one were to say that the psuche weaves or builds. For it's surely better not to say that the psuche pities, learns, or thinks, but that the man does these things with his psuche. And note that to do something with your psuche is not like doing something with your hands. It's like doing something with your talents, with your abilities. Now, in the 19th century, George Henry Lewis, the husband of George Eliot, observed in his book, The Physical Basis of Mind in 1877, it is the man and not the brain that thinks. It is the organism as a whole and not one organ that feels and acts, that is a bullseye. And in the 20th century, the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote in his philosophical investigations in 1953, only of a human being and of what resembles, behaves like a, human be a living human being, can one say it has sensations, it sees, is blind, it hears, is deaf, is conscious, or unconscious. Thank you very much.